Let's stand together for the reading of God's word from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Please be seated. The only way to avoid criticism is not to attempt to do anything of any particular significance or effect. And even then you'll be criticized for being passive. The very nature of our fallen society in which we all live is, I'm afraid, that we find it far easier to see the speck in our brother's eye than the log in our own eye. We are blind to our own faults while we tend to see the faults of others with crystal clear 2020 eyesight. It is easier to blame others than examine our own lives, far more satisfying to dissect someone else's mistakes than to face up to our own. And the most popular strategy for avoiding our own need to grow spiritually is to be focused on the need of other people to grow spiritually. That was a wonderful sermon. I'm sure it'll be good for someone else. It happens from cradle to grave. We all have experienced the knife of unjust criticism and the axe of belittling condemnation, the schoolyard. The schoolyard is not only the place for games of tag, it is also the place where we are excluded from the in crowd and labeled as fat or stupid or ugly. As we grow, the labeling becomes more subtle, but nonetheless acute, as it can trigger scars from childhood. A teenager is subtly ostracized from a peer group by a cutting remark about the color of their jeans or the style of their hair. No one can criticize me for the style of my hair as I get more and more bald, mercifully. A college student is triggered by a remark about their ethnicity or their cultural background that may be on the surface innocent enough and well-intended, but the effect can be to squeeze the personality of the recipient of the remark into a small hold of anger. It carries on throughout adult life, even into old age. Well, we face the same tendency now to uh, pass remarks about someone's uh, parenting skills. It seems hard for us to face up to the truth that the damage done by these kind of remarks can be so acute that only the inside walls of a bedroom can fully grasp the tears of anguish that it can generate. Tread softly. Each of us has passions and desires that are no less than a reflection of the image of God. And when trashed by unjust criticism or unfair condemnation, look sometimes in vain for a way to counter the emotional damage. I, I must confess before you all that nothing in my life has been more painful than unjust criticism and unfair condemnation. Uh, I've uh, experienced physical pain. Uh, these days I can hardly get out of bed without physical pain. But physical pain, though terrible, seems to me to be more surface level. It's not about my identity. It doesn't threaten to reshape who I am. Whereas criticism and condemnation threatens not just our physical experience, but seems to have a power to define us as unworthy of love or acceptance. You know, oh, look at him, he's like that. 
Sometimes, at its worst, I think it is almost a sort of verbal murder where Cain attacks Abel, not with sword in this instance, but with condemnation. What is the answer to all that? Well, the answer to it is theology. <laughs> yep, theology. No rescue from unjust criticism can be found finally in, than in any other place than an encounter with the grace of God and the God of the Bible. And it is this reality that gives these words with which we are concluding our study of Romans 8 in the next few weeks power. They are not merely a rhetorical flight of fancy with questions that waltz up a stairway to heaven with ascending oratory. No, they are substantial. Answering the problem of unjust criticism by the theology of the gospel, by the truth of the gospel. They counter the hundred questions about our worth and value that cloud our thoughts and anger our minds by careful counter questions that rest on the sovereign person of God himself. This end is in two parts. The first we're looking at this morning from verses 31 to 34 takes us to the final judgment seat of God and who there is justified and who there is condemned. And from that vantage point, schoolyard bullying and office politics, they're defeated in the heart of the believer. And then the second part, which we'll look at next week, takes us through the killing fields of this world and shows us how the flower of love, fragile as it seems to us, is actually invested with the sovereign power of God and cannot be taken away from those who love God. So in verses 31 to 34, Paul is asking five questions that give us assurance, certainty, of our eternal verdicts before the judgment seat of God. Underneath each of these five questions are two statements. God justifies, Christ died. They give a rock solid foundation that allows us to transcend our critics, both internal and external, while in no way resisting learning from our real mistakes nonetheless prevent us from being defined in our essential person, who we are, is unworthy and judged and condemned. So what I want to do then this morning is show us these five unanswerable questions and then very briefly conclude. So here they are first. What then shall we say to these things? Now, it's important to realize Paul is referring not just to the immediately preceding verse, but actually to his whole argument that began in Romans chapter 5. Let me read out for you the first couple of verses there from Romans 5 as a reminder. He said there, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, this is secure and unshakable, this gospel of God. We rejoice with brave courage because we're now established forever in a realm of grace and glory. This, this huge security, this huge assurance, this guarantee, and Paul then answers objections against the doctrine of assurance, and now he comes to chapter 8, to the conclusion, what then shall we say to all these things? Now let me commend that question to you. Would you today insist on applying the truth that you believe? Would you not let your faith remain merely theory or only academically relevant to technical matters of understanding the text? Would you insist on taking the truth and asking yourself how it applies to the criticism or the condemnation or the sense of unworth that you face? What can you say in light of all these things, this truth of the gospel? Seems to me the reason why so many of us live in the shadowlands and we could ascend the hill of joy and reside there in relationship with God is because we do not actually apply God's truth. We do not actually take the medicine 
that the Bible gives us. And when we look at it, we put it in the medicine cabinet. We, we order the truth very carefully, you know, doctrine of assurance on a little label. But it won't do any good like that. It has to be actually taken like medicine. George Muller, the uh, great Christian leader uh, from uh, Bristol, said that the secret of the Christian life is finding ourselves happy in God. In other words, it is not enough simply to know the truth. The truth has to be administered to us, like medicine must be administered in order to have any healing effect. So what then shall we say to all these things? Are these things actually true? And if they are, then what's the application? What's the consequence to what you're feeling now? You know, if the devil cannot stop us from hearing the Bible, he will tempt to stop us from believing the Bible. And if he cannot stop us from believing the Bible, he will try to stop us from applying the Bible. What then shall we say to all these things? Second unanswerable question, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now that is a question for the ages. If God is for us, who can be against us? Would you replace, as we apply this text, the who with a name? Would you consider a person who has unjustly criticized you and assert their name in the text? If God is for me, and I know he is because of all these things in the gospel, he is for me. Then can, and then insert the name of that person, can that person be against me? A great early Christian leader, Chris Ostom, the golden mouth, one of the greatest preachers the church has ever had, argued along these lines that this here means that those who are against us are not really against us. In other words, look at everything. Every person's action, even when against you, as really coming from God. And therefore, this cannot really be against me. It must be for me, because God is for me. And so and so may have planned it for evil, but God planned it for good. And therefore, it's not really against me, it's for me. If God takes away my beloved, it is because he has something good for me. As I say, the answer to unjust criticism and unfair condemnation is good theology. I like the Peanuts cartoons. Do you like those? They're kind of fun. There's one where Lucy is worrying about the, uh, the rain. It's rained hard all day and she says, I, I, I'm worrying that there's going to be a flood over the whole world. And then Linus says, you know, God has actually promised in the Bible that will never happen again. Lucy says, well, thank goodness, that's the weight off my mind. Linus replies, good theology has a way of doing that. Paul is saying that God is in and through and giving and a part of and in control of all. Look, this is not 16th century theology, right? Paul wrote a long time before Calvin. And Chrysostom, in case you need a little uptake on your church history, was writing a long time before Calvin too. You name it. You name the thing or person against you. God has planned it for your good. It's not then really against you. It is really for you. Why? Because God is the cause of all. And he is for you. And therefore all is for you. And nothing and no one can be against you. Third unanswerable question. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how would he not also with him graciously give us all things? So, 
If God gave his own son to die for us, then surely whatever else we need, he will give us too. What is all these other things that he's going to give? By this, Paul means whatever is necessary for our good and joy and eternal satisfaction of God. It does not just mean spiritual things. It can be material things too, but it does not mean that God will give us all things that we want, for sometimes the things that we want are not good for us. Praise God for prayers I have prayed that He has not answered, for His ways are better than mine. It does not mean that God will give us everything we want, nor does it mean that God will give us everything in the universe to own and possess in a sort of materialistic or selfish sense. What it means is that whatever is to our good and great joy for the purpose of our appearing before God's judgment seat as just and righteous, whatever that is, according to His wisdom, He will give you. How would He not also graciously give us all things? I think we can be too pious about this sometimes. I praise God for the little gifts He has given me. I remember uh, one winter feeling very discouraged and asking God for a pair of cowboy boots. It seemed very unlikely that I would ever have a pair of cowboy boots, but rather through a rather strange series of circumstances, a pair of cowboy boots from Texas made their way to my hands in London. I still have them. I haven't yet worn them on a Sunday morning, but I will, I can guarantee you. I have not felt embarrassed to pray for God for the gift of a new book, or ask for a new shirt or tie, or even a suit. It's a very college church kind of prayer, that one. I have been more surprised by God's attention to the small details of my desires than perhaps anything else in my Christian life. He really is a good father who loves to give good gifts to his children. Other times I've pleaded before heaven for nights on end and have my prayers not answered. Some of those prayers I now can praise God that they were not answered for now I see better than I did then. Other prayers that have not been answered still bemuse me. But then I ask, if God gave his own son, how would he not also give me all good things? It is an unanswerable question. I mean, if a man comes and gives you the keys to a brand new Rolls Royce, do you really think he will not buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks to celebrate? Or if you don't like Starbucks, somewhere else perhaps instead. It's just absurd to think otherwise. If, if, if God gave you his own son, do you really think he's not going to give you everything else you need to? What a sweet joy to realize that when you're being condemned by your own feelings of inadequacy or the attacks of some unfair critic, that God is at the same time arranging all things for your good and joy. I, I, I remember one particularly brutal series of criticisms I received publicly some years ago. And then one morning finding uh, a person who left me a personal simple gift next to my uh, study door. It, it wasn't much actually. But then it was everything. For it meant that God noticed and he cared and I was not who they said I, said I was. Oh no, I, I was the one that God gave his own son for. And when they said that I was a worthless son of a devil who cast out demons by the prince of demons, I had a little token of love from my father that reminded me that actually I was the one for whom his son had died. Fourth, unanswerable question. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Now, my friends, this is how the theology of election should be used. So often it has become controversial in the Christian church when the intention of the doctrine of election is that it should be free. The election of God is not intended to judge some and exclude others. 
It's intended to give security to those who put their faith in Jesus. If you have put your faith in Jesus, then by definition, you are elect. You are God's elect. Now apply it. What does that mean? What does it mean that you are chosen by God from since before the creation of the world? What does it mean that God personally knew you and therefore predestined you and conformed you to the likeness of his Son, justified, glorified? What does it mean that he snatched you like a burning brand out of the fire and rescued you from eternal condemnation? What does it mean that he knit you together in your mother's womb? What does it mean that Christ gave his blood for the church? What does it mean that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, cannot be changed? means you're free. I think this is the great secret of effective evangelistic effort and missionary risks for the glory of God. If you are not sure that you're saved, then you will spend your energy worrying about your eternal destiny. And when someone brings a charge against you, it will add fuel to the flame, and your time and thoughts and focus will be taken up by concerns about whether they and what they're saying is true or not. But if you are sure that you're saved, and therefore you are God's elect, then you've settled that matter. It no longer captures your thoughts and attention. So now you can get on and serve God. The devil wants God's people to worry about whether they are saved, and he wants those who are not yet Christians to be sure they're going to heaven. The devil aims to unsettle God's people and keep in false comfort those who do not believe in Jesus. And so if you ask someone today who does not follow Jesus whether they think they're going to heaven, many will say, oh yeah, sure. There's a far horizon beyond this mortal coil, and I'm going to go there and spend eternity with my friends plucking on a harp on a cloud. But then there is that faithful Christian who really is going to spend eternity rejoicing with God and is constantly concerned about whether he is saved. Would you ask yourself, this unanswerable question. Who is going to bring a charge against God's elect? If God shows me, who can reject me? No one. Fifth unanswerable question, who is to condemn? Well, the answer would appear to be that there are many immediately rushes into our mind many people and things that condemn us, rushes into our mind that person who thinks that about us and unfairly condemns us, rushes into our mind that sin we committed, that thing we did, that thing we should have done and didn't do, rushes into our mind a thousand reasons why we are condemned, some of them just, some of them unjust. Who who is to condemn? The answer would appear to be a lot of things, a lot of people. In fact, the list appears to grow with each passing day and year upon year. The weight of condemnation gathers around the neck of each of us like a millstone. But, says Paul, let us think about this rightly. Who is the one to condemn? Well, it's Jesus. He is the judge. Now, that is a terrifying thought, for if the list of people and events to condemn us appears some days to be endless, the amount of things and thoughts that Jesus knows, that even those who condemn us do not know, that appears even worse, far worse, truly terrifying. 
He is the one who rightly judges the whole earth, including us. But then, where is Jesus and what did he do? Jesus is the one who took the condemnation for us. Paul began this chapter, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and now he returns to it again. Jesus took our condemnation by dying for us, taking our sins, and not only did he die, he rose again. His death was proven effective. He took our condemnation, our sins, for he was righteous, shown by the fact of his resurrection. And not only was he raised, he is now at the right hand of God. Paul now returns to chapter 5, where he began this whole section. We have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So why so confident? Why so assured? Because Christ is at the right hand of God. He sits in the place of honor, fixed and firm and established and unmovable and victorious, and we in Him, therefore, cannot be condemned. That soul that I on Jesus have leaned for a pose, I will not, I cannot desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Who will condemn us? No one. Because the only one who can rightly condemn us, God himself has sent the judge, Jesus, to die for us, to take our condemnation, and we in him are fixed and established and unmovable in the realm of grace and glory. There he is at the right hand of God, and he is praying for us. When you have nothing you can say in prayer, there he is sweating drops of blood in prayer for us. When we cannot pray, there he is asking that even though the devil should sift us like wheat, we would not fail. No, never, no, never, no, never. For he died for us. He rose for us. He sits at the right hand of God for us. And he intercedes for us. Rejoice. You are free, free to serve God. Nothing, no one can condemn you. You are unshakable. What other conclusion could there be from these things? If God is for you, who can be against you? If God gave you a son, won't he give you everything else? If God chose you, who can reject you? If Jesus died for you and is praying for you, who can condemn you? No one. No one. 